So it is my great pleasure to introduce Joe and our next as our next speaker. And this is going to be the final presentation for this room today. Uh, Joe, I'm adding you to the screen now. Hello. And promptly uh, at your start time, I'm going to add your, your speaker deck. So a pleasure to see you. Thank you for speaking at Phosphor G this year. Indeed. So hi, everyone. Um, yeah, I'm going to talk to you about data discovery and metadata creation untouched by human hands. So this is me. Uh, I'm the technical evangelist for data discoverability at Aston Technology, which is just a fancy way of saying that I help people find and share data. So Aston was founded in 2006. And although we're, we're based in Epsom, which is near London, um, we've got 25 odd staff spread across Europe now. And we do spatial and data stuff um, based on the open source technology stack. So um, the first thing is I'm not a coder. Um, I, uh, my, my real passion is enabling other people to do their job, which might be coding um, or it might not be. Um, but anyway, making that as easy as possible for them, preferably with open source tools, obviously. Um, and I'm here to tell you this really important fact which is that metadata is really hard. Um, it's complex and it's time consuming and people, it's hard to know where to start. And, and there's a really steep learning curve and, and often people don't get any, um, any training. It's something that they have to do um, in addition to their day job and everything's really complicated. And you know, that makes me sad. And, and even worse, um, manual metadata entry really doesn't scale at all. Um, you know, solutions that work for a small number of data sets don't work so well for, ten, for thousands. Um, this leads to big problems with, you know, people just giving up. They don't complete all of the metadata. It's not accurate. Um, it's not kept up to date. And nobody really knows who's responsible. So we're going to fix that by automating all of the things. Hooray. Now, this is not a new concept. Um, people have been deriving at least some metadata elements for years, um, you know, and it, it's not even uh, a new concept to use FOSS tools for it. There's, there's plenty. I've grabbed a few logos for some of them. Um, and, and obviously, it's, it's not just done in geospatial as well. Things like uh, CityML have uh, methods for describing, for, for, for calculating metadata. And of course, some metadata elements, you know, your file system will, will derive some metadata elements, you know, like the title and the, the location of your data and, you know, when it was last updated um, and, and tools like Quantum GIS, QGIS, will show you the, um, the spatial extents and useful things like that. However, we're still left with a few elements that we can't uh, derive in this programmatic way, um, like nice human readable titles and abstracts and keywords and things like that. Those are, those are much harder to do programmatically and hard again to do it at scale. So we have bolted together a number of, of open source tools and libraries that we're hoping to use to, um, to overcome this, this challenge. <clears throat> Excuse me. And part one is Metadata Crawler. So Crawler is a, it's a script for discovering data, be that spatial or non-spatial. It could be in file systems or databases, on websites, it could be raster, it could be vector. Um, and for each data source that it finds, it derives as much of the metadata as it can. So the kind of things that we've already talked about. A crawler is built on some libraries um, that were built by Titleus uh, uh, for the 
Talend um, ETL spatial plugin. So um, that's again, that's kind of open source. Um, and it's a really handy tool because it can be run as a, as a web service um, or as a cross-platform shell script. So it, it's, very, it's a very neat tool. Um, so we've taken Crawler and we've extended it to work with non-spatial data, as I said, and also to output metadata in the UK Gemini metadata profile. So here's the here's the workflow. Um, so Crawler takes databases and files, um, and it um, it creates a, an XML-based metadata record for each of those data sources, um, and it uses a set of placeholders for any elements that it can't actually derive. Um, so the first stage of the process is that you get a bunch of of XML files. Um, that you can then take and, and put in, a, in in your metadata catalog. Um, if you've got a, a metadata catalog that can take transactional CSW, then Crawler can input them directly into the catalog. Um, and it can also create new records or update existing ones as, as it needs to. So um, whilst we've mainly been working with Geo Network, um, this is all standards compliant stuff. So it would presumably work with other metadata catalogs as well. So the next stage, uh, first of all, we've got the old approach that we that we used to use. Um, and, and what we do is, is we'd provide our customers with a spreadsheet, um, which is effectively a, a second run through all of their data um, with a row per record with fields for them to fill in, like the abstract, uh, the keywords, and the contact information. So we, you, you know, Excel might be clumsy, but people like it, and they can copy and paste, and you know, do things in bulk. So it, it works. It works pretty well for this. Um, and and we use controlled text and things like that, so that we could keep things nice and nice and precise. So what we ended up with then is, um, is a CSV file with these additional metadata elements. So we then wrap the Geo Network um, API in a, in a Python script and update the records in the catalog with the additional information from this CSV file. Um, generally, we use Geo Network hosted up on AWS which means that we can actually let our users run these scripts and update their own metadata records um, using, using environments like, like Cloud9 to save them needing to, to kind of install Python libraries on their, on their work computers, which seems to panic people for some reason. Um, for, for extra geek points, um, if rather than running the scripts themselves, what they can do is they can email the CSV as um, as an abs as a as an attachment to an email, um, and then we have another set of uh, processing scripts that um, that take that attachment, pop it into an S3 bucket that the Geo Network server can get at, and then we have another Python script that extracts the the information and updates Geo Network. But I want to talk about the cool new approach that we're that we're going for for getting to that point, which is, um, I have to say, mostly uh, only slightly better than a proof of concept. Um, the code does exist, but really only in uh, in Colab notebooks at the moment. So now we can use some um, Python and some machine learning and natural language processing to try and extract this missing information. So the, the, the titles and the abstracts and things like that from the actual data itself. So as an example of this, um, what I've got there is a really long and complicated um, text. It's a, it's a real metadata um, example. Um, it's about tree planting in Scotland. Um, and so if we run this through some natural language processing tools, 
then we can extract the keywords from it. We can geoparse it, we can find the geographic keywords and we can auto summarize it to get us a, a reasonably coherent abstract. Um, so what we are intending to do with this is to extend the, the keyword extraction in particular to pull out things like um, variations in spelling and, and, and synonyms. Um, and because we do a lot of work in Scotland, we're also interested in getting uh, Gaelic place names as well. So we've got to, we're going to extend this, this processing to, to do these additional tasks. So here's the sort of flow chart of what we're talking about. So we've got our spatial uh, data set and we run it through crawler to extract the basic information um, as we talked about earlier. Then we can pick up the geographic information. We've got, we can pick up the extent. We can get geographic keywords out. Um, we can extract the, the text keywords, as I said. And then we can do things like refine the keywords and, and rank them. And we can compare them with code lists like uh, the Inspire code lists, for instance, to give us a set of, of controlled keywords and free text ones. So when we combine all of those things together and we, we do our auto summarizing to create an abstract, then effectively, with the information that we already got from Crawler, we can, uh, we can create our entire metadata record. Now, we, we, we know that we can, we can train uh, this machine learning workflow on a, a huge corpus of existing metadata records. Um, and we've also got quite a bit of best practice guidance um, for, for data discovery around search engine optimization. Um, so lengths of titles and abstracts and things like that. So we've got a set of rules that we can that we can use as well. So at this point, we've we've got um, effectively a, a modular workflow um, that we're trying to, to to kind of get to the point where it's um, fully fully modular and that we can avoid any any silos or, or technological lock in. So we'd like to get to the point where we're not saying that you have to use geo network um, or, or that you have to use specific machine learning libraries um, at the moment you know we're using geo network but we'd like to get to the point where this is all quite um, agnostic in terms of the, the the programs that we use so the end result will be metadata records that need minimal human intervention um, now, you, you probably do actually want a human person to uh, to review them before publishing. Um, you know, we, we don't want to go publishing things that, that people haven't had the chance to, to check over. And of course, we're expecting that our machine learning process will need some um, refinement as well. So, but what we're hoping is that people will just be able to look at the records very briefly and say, yeah, I'm happy with that and then publish it. Uh, which is a big step forward from where we are now, where even if we've derived a set of metadata records, then they've still got 3,000 abstracts to fill in, which is um, a bit of a blocker. So the usual caveats apply um, with, with this kind of thing. Um, we've got, we have all of the bits and pieces. Um, but as I said earlier, they, they mostly exist as, as kind of Google Colab notebooks at present. And it's going to take a lot of work moving forward to, to kind of scale all of this. And we're going to be wanting to get um, expert assistance on some of the machine learning side of things and also speak to some uh, search engine optimization experts to to, to really refine our results and, and make sure that what we're doing is actually um, actually worthwhile. Um, 
so here's a couple of, of useful references to, uh, to some of the technologies. So we've got the link to, to Talon Spatial, which is, as I say, the kind of reference, the, the kind of starting point for, for Crawler. Um, it's a really, really useful tool for doing clever uh, ETL things with, with your geospatial data. And I think we have to thank Titleus uh, an enormous amount for creating uh, talent spatial and, and continuing to maintain it. And also here's a link to the Geospatial Commission um, search engine best practice guide, which if you're in the talk I was doing earlier with, with, uh, with, with Paul Van Genuchten, um, we discussed it then, but basically it's a lot of really useful information for data publishers um, wanting to make their metadata as, as, as easy to find and easy to share as possible. Um, and actually, that's it from me. Uh, this is slightly shorter than uh, uh, than the earlier one, but that's probably not a problem. Um, so if you'd like to get in touch with me to find out a bit more, um, then there's my email and my Twitter handle, or you can get in touch with me at, at astontechnology.com. And so there's our, our Aston Twitter handle as well. So that's it from me. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks, Joel. That was great. Uh, we have a number of questions coming in from uh, your adoring public. There's also lots of little claps and emoji things going by. So first question, um, I'll just put it up here, is what is the difference between talent uh, data integration and geonetwork harvester? Um, so, um, so the geonetwork harvester can um, can harvest metadata records, but um, Talend actually discovers the data sources themselves. So if you point Talend at a, a database, for example, it will it will find all of the spatial tables in that database and create metadata records for them. Um, or you can point it at, uh, at files in a in a file system. Um, we're about to extend it to to actually find. Um, to try and extract some decent metadata from things like PDFs, but that's a bit of a work in progress. Um, whereas the Geo Network Harvester is for ingesting metadata records themselves rather than working with the actual data. Okay, thanks. Uh, the next one you might have already answered in your talk. It was asked a little bit earlier in the program. It was, can you generate keywords from the abstract? Um, I'm sure we can. If, we, if people have got well, we, we know we can. Um, if, if people already have an abstract, then we can we can work at generating keywords from that. Um, we are coming from the position where people might not even have an abstract yet. So it's about creating that abstract and the keywords and a nice human readable title. But one bit that I didn't mention was that we're envisaging a kind of a second round of, of um, refining these keywords and things like that based on on search engine analytics so um, if if people are, are not finding records is it because we need to add in some different keywords or, or things like that okay um, thanks the next question is fairly long so um, this was in reference to the auto summary what do you think about the active metadata concept? you apply machine learning models to metadata so that it can be used to make decisions and trigger actions? Wow. Um, <laughs> that's probably something that we would want to come back to when we've we've had a good a good stab at this first uh, first machine learning um, yeah, that's work. That's the kind of question where you yeah. ask people to, to visit you at the booth in the exhibit center later. Maybe maybe this time next year rather than later in later in this phosphagy. But no, that's a really interesting question and and um, one that I'll certainly spend some time thinking about. But we're a little bit um, new on this machine learning journey, I think, to do really clever things like that. Okay. Um, do, 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 and let me see if I can figure this one out. So when you are linking the keywords to controlled vocabularies with URI as names for things, would that then help discover related data across geo-network instances? 
You could almost believe that I'd actually preceded this question, although I, I, I swear I didn't. Um, we sincerely hope so. Um, we, we're developing the, the idea of a kind of um, almost like a, a, a meta catalog sitting on top of, of a bunch of metadata catalogs that might help, um, you know, large organizations or, or, or governments or whatever to, to, to kind of pull together information from many catalogs. So yeah, we, we would hope that that would be via keywords or, um, or, or via, you know, yeah, other linked data things. But certainly that's something that we want to do because a lot of the organizations that we work with have many different catalogs. And one of the big problems that people have is that they don't know which catalog to look in. So if we can make that much easier, then I think that would be a really good thing. Excellent. Um, the next question I've got is, uh, what sort of approaches do you have for ensuring proper review of metadata pre-publishing? OK, so um, with GeoNetwork, we know that we can provide that we can, they're already built in uh, workflow methods for submitting metadata for review so that it has to be reviewed and approved before it's published. Um, so I, th I think certainly from the Geo Network perspective, that's already kind of built in, um, you know, using the, the the workflow that's that's already there. Um, with, for other metadata catalogs, I'm 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 not sure, but generally speaking, I, I think we would we would definitely want to get the buy-in of the people who owned the data. <laughs> um, you know, we want them to trust the approach, and we want them to to be happy with it. So we definitely want them to review things before. Um, so it would create a draft and then it would go through a normal review process. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And the last question I've got is a little bit more about the GeoNetwork project. Is GeoNetwork on the stack bandwagon like so many seem to be? Uh, Jody, do you know the answer to this question? <laughs> I really do, actually. So stack is an early precursor to the um, like all of the, the OGC API uh, protocols. And so it is really a lot closer to the um, this, the cover, the CSW specification rather than the catalog specification, which Geo Network focuses on. So if you're looking for an OGC API um, protocol that Geo Network is going after, we're really looking at the OGC API records protocol, which is focused on metadata content rather than stack, which Yes, it has metadata, but those metadata are associated with like specific raster images. So it's a little bit more like a WFS uh, with some attributes and a really big geometry that happens to be a, a cloud optimized GeoTIFF. Um, so it would be interesting if we could maybe think about harvesting the certainly yeah. the, the metadata from from a, yeah. from Stack. But I would view Stack as being closer to a WFS than a catalog service. It's, um, you know, it's it's a really, it was a, such a strong, such a strong um, technical approach that, you know, it's very influential in terms of rallying the other, the other OGC standards uh, to head in that direction. Cool. Well, thanks, Joe. Uh, everyone's kept you pretty busy with questions. We've almost caught you up to your time slot. Indeed. And other people are saying <laughs> your questions are not planted. So that's that's kind of good. <laughs> no, no, honestly. But I couldn't have asked for better questions, mostly. <laughs> excellent, excellent. OK, well, thank you so much for speaking uh, twice today. Uh, do you have any other talks um, scheduled for the week? I do, but not for Phosphor-G. Um, there is a, there's a conference in the UK called Data Connect 21, which is happening this whole week as well, which is about um, doing things with data in, in government. And so I'm talking tomorrow um, about how, why standards are fun and people should get involved with them. So well, any excellent. UK people, then find me at Data Connect 21 tomorrow. Well, I'm glad that, um, that we got a little bit of Joe in our Phosphor G schedule. It makes everyone happier. Thank you. Okay. Um, <laughs> I think that's it for me wrap, to wrap it up. Thank you so much. Everyone hit the little clap button in the channel. I'm just holding it open for you guys to clap. 
and then we can uh, we'll wrap things up. Okay. Thank you very much. Brilliant. And I need Thank to you. figure out how to shut you off. <laughs> <laughs>